Yeah, so we're gonna get started with our WordPress accessibility meetup today. And we have accessibility, ask me anything with Amber Hines, Chris Hines, Jones, and Raghavendra. So just, we have we have a few announcements here. Um, you can join our Facebook group to connect between meetups. Um, that's the best place to speak to most of the people that are here in the chat and get any questions answered or answer any questions about anything related to accessibility. Um, and that is on facebook.com slash groups slash WordPress dot accessibility. You can also find upcoming events and past recordings in one place. We always get asked if this if this meetup is being recorded and it is. You can find it in about one to two weeks after the date. And that's gonna be on equalizeddigital.com slash meetup. And you can also join our email list to get news and event announcements. That's going to be on equalizeddigital.com slash focus state, focus dash state. And we usually send an email every Wednesday where we have the meetup recaps and some meetup and upcoming meetup announcements and sometimes other events. And we also have any news related to accessibility. You can also tune in to our podcast. Uh, where we upload the recorded version, the only the audio version of the meetups. And that's going to be at accessibilitycraft.com. We are seeking additional sponsors for the meetup. Um, so the WordPress Foundation does not um, does not sponsor um, the captions or the transcript or ASL. So we're always looking for sponsors for a meetup. And if you're interested in learning more about sponsoring meetup, or if you have any questions, um, you can email us at meetup at equalizeddigital.com. And that goes to both me and Amber. And we usually reply within 24 to 48 hours. Um, so I've mentioned Equalize Digital a lot of times. We are the organizer of, of um, this meetup and we have our WordPress plugin accessibility checker that scans for accessibility problems and provides reports on the post edit screen to make building accessible websites easier. You can find us on Twitter. I will continue saying Twitter, um, not X, <laughs> at Equalize Digital. And we have a live captioning sponsor today. We have Ivy Cat. Um, Ivy Cat helps clients and agencies create, market, and maintain high performing WordPress websites and web apps that are fast, easy to use, accessible, and get results. Ivy Cat's website care plans, search engine optimization, and accessibility services help clients grow and succeed without the stress and headaches of doing it alone. Their website is ivycat.com and you can find them on Twitter at ivycatweb. And we always encourage people to say thank you to our sponsors on Twitter. So if you have a chance, um, you can just go do that. Um, we're very glad to have them sponsoring today's meetup. And we have our upcoming events. Um, the next one is, the next WordPress accessibility meetup is Sunshine Photo Card Accessibility Audit with Alex Stein and Amber. And that's gonna be on Monday, March 18 at 7 p.m. Central. Then we also have a WordPress, v WordPress VIP event. It's called a Blueprint for Federal Web Modernization. That's gonna be with Lone Rock, Lone Rock Point um, WordPress VIP and with Amber from Equalize Digital. That's going to be on Tuesday, March 19th at 12 p.m. Central. Then the next meetup that we have in this same time slot, the first Thursday of the month, it's going to be Demystifying European Accessibility Laws an Engaging Overview. We're very excited to finally have someone come talk about European Accessibility Laws. Um, so that's going to be on Thursday, April 4th at 10 a.m. Central. And then we are gonna have the mobile accessibility building and testing accessibility mobile sites and native apps on Monday, April 15th at 7 p.m. Central. Um, so we're done with announcements. Um, now I would like our panelists to introduce themselves. 
Um, so I'm just going to stop sharing. Um, my, by the way, my name is Paula, and I'm going to be moderating today's um, panel. I am the content specialist at Equalize Digital. So pretty much everything you see, close to 90% of everything that you see on social, um, I'm the one that posts that. Um, and I help planning meetup. So now um, take it away, Amber. Yep. Thank you. So I think most people know me because I help run meetups. So you see me a lot if you come to meetups. But for anyone who doesn't, or maybe who's watching this on YouTube after the fact, uh, I am Amber Hines. I'm the CEO at Equalize Digital. Uh, we're a mission-driven organization that focuses all on WordPress accessibility. Uh, it sort of stemmed out of a business that started with me as a freelancer, and then it grew into a full agency um, with Chris and Steve and some other team members. Um, and we really started doing accessibility in around 2016 and have gotten you know deeper and deeper into it because it was a passion that I realized I loved and I think they love too. And I'll hand off to Chris if you want to introduce yourself and share a little bit. Uh, you are muted. Yeah. Um, so my name is Chris Hines. I handle our company's sales, uh, HR and finance efforts. That's primarily what I've been doing with the company for uh, a, a long time, even since our agency days back in the mid 2010s. Um, I have done, you know, some project management and project fulfillment work, but I feel like I'm at my best when I'm helping connect people with the right solutions, whether that's accessibility, a new bespoke website, um, or a combination of things. And so if you've ever reached out to Equalize Digital needing help with something related to accessibility or website, um, you have probably exchanged emails or spoken with me at some point. And if you haven't spoken me with me yet, but you feel like you need some help with something related to accessibility, I would be happy to talk to you and try to connect you with the best possible solution, whether that is us or uh, Raga, which will, who will introduce himself in a minute, or with someone else entirely who isn't even here. My goal is really just to get people connected with the thing that's best for them based on their goals. Uh, Steve? Yeah, I'm Steve Jones. I'm uh, owner and CTO here at Equalize Digital. I oversee the development of our accessible products and services, most notably our accessibility checker WordPress plugin. Um, unlike Chris, I'm more of the man behind the curtain who Amber drags out every now and then to come and talk to you guys. <laughs> so I'm, I'm happy to be here. And then uh, Raga, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes. Hi everyone. My name is Raga Vendra Satish Perry. Everyone calls me Raga and I'm the founder of Digital A11Y. I um, do a lot of consulting with large and small enterprises. I work here with Equalize Digital, sometimes a lot with Amber, both on WordPress accessibility meetup uh, and the conference the yearly conference also thank you everyone Great. for your introductions um so amber for our first question um petra asked how do you ensure that the semantic heading structure is logical when editors that may not be aware of accessibility can pick and choose components and put them in any order yeah, so um, I think there's a couple of different ways that we can ensure that content editors who don't know anything um, are choosing things appropriately. Um, and it's twofold. One is creating training. I think you have you have to train people. Um, so whether that's a customer who's going to be managing the website after you've built it and you're handing it off, um, you need to include some basic extra accessibility training to them or your internal team. Um, I think including tools is really important. So obviously that was a lot of the motivation between behind our accessibility checker plugin was to get them information right where they're creating content because that is the easiest. But if you don't have a WordPress website or something, there's other um, browser-based tools that can be used like Wave. Um, there's uh, on the on the like heading structure specifically, there's a free plugin that I love called Headings Map. I say plugin. It's it's not actually a plugin. It's for your browser. It's a browser right? extension. Yeah. It's a browser okay, extension. it's a browser extension. Yeah. All right, there we go. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I love that one because I just have it and I use it all the time. In addition to um, some of the stuff in WordPress, because like WordPress has WordPress Core has that outline tool in the block editor. 
but it only recognizes the WordPress heading block. It doesn't recognize any custom blocks or which would include sometimes block libraries. So it's almost useless. Mm -hmm. uh, so that headings map browser extension, which we can definitely include um, some, I think we can in include some links to this when we post the recording. Uh, but I think, and Steve, I might hand this off to you. Like one of the things that we've thought about a lot on this as we're building custom blocks, because when we build websites, we use core blocks and we use custom ACF blocks mm -hmm. typically. Um, we don't use a lot of block libraries or things, but when we're building something like, let's say an accordion or even like a team block where there's a going to be a group of people that are pulled from a team post type. And then there's a heading above it. This is like what category they're in for their team, right? Yeah. We've realized that you can't just say by default, that's going to be an H2 because a client might come along and be like, but I want to show a team of people nested three levels down, right? So then we have to build options for them to choose their heading level and all those custom blocks. And I don't know if you want to speak to that at all about like how you yeah. think about when someone needs a choice for a heading level. Yeah, I mean, I don't know that we can like necessarily like from a programmatic standpoint, like choose the exact right heading. We might be able to choose the next right one, um, but we could like block ones that we know absolutely should not be next, right? Um, but then you get into, you, you can get into a lot of technical stuff when it comes to WordPress websites and stuff and what's hard coded, you know, like what's, what else exists on the page? What's the heading order of all, all you know, things outside of the content area. So there, there's a lot mm -hmm. to think about. And I think that goes back to your initial point was, you know, education really under having the knowledge of what correct semantic heading order is. Yeah. yeah, and I'll add something really quick. As a content creator that does not know anything about developing, I call myself a mogul in that aspect. <laughs> um, what I do is that, um, for example, I was working on my personal website and I installed a theme for it and the heading orders were all messed up. So what I had to do in that case as a non-developer was I had to go onto the customization um, bar that comes on the on the left on WordPress. Um, so that helps me work with the heading order there and the styling because sometimes you, what content creator people think about usually it's how it looks, not how accessible it could be. Um, so that could be a way to deal with that aspect. You can keep you can have a correct heading structure and still make things look how how you want them to look. Um, mm -hmm. You just have to know how to use the customization tool in WordPress, which is very easy. Um, so I think we're going to have another question for Steve. Um, Peter said that he has a client asking about guidelines for a QR code driven app landing page that will mainly be used outdoors to display info about memorial markers or sculptures in a park setting. They're asking about font size, word count per page and navigation. So Steve, what recommendations would you have about a website like this? Yeah, yeah, thanks for the question, Peter. This is definitely a, a, a unique one. Um, I think as far as like compliance, right, you're still like held to the normal WCAG guidelines in this regard, because my assumption is that people would be using their phones to scan these QR codes to pull up this website on their phone. Uh, I hope that's the correct assumption. But uh, but I think I think you got to take environment into in in into consideration here, too. Right. These people will be outside, um, you know, uh, there'll be. So like, I don't know if I want to nail down a minimum font size, but like, if it was me, I'd probably go a little beyond the uh, the guidelines, and I'd probably stick with something like a minimum sixteen uh, pixel font. Um, yeah, or even like eighteen or twenty, maybe. Yeah. I don't know on a mobile phone. Yeah, I definitely go up from what the guidelines are because these people, you know, people would be outside. They're kind of like looking at real life elements and their phone at the same time, and. Then I think your heading font sizes should go up from there accordingly. Um, as far as word count, I'd probably be like, I'd probably be as concise as possible while still conveying 
the message. I don't know, like a word count, like 250, 300, something that might even be too much too. Um, um, so like you can use like, you can use elements, HTML elements to help convey that information quicker, like bullet points. And, uh, you know, of course, having the right semantic headings as we've just talked about. Um, if there's navigation involved in this page that comes up, uh, I'd make it as simple as possible and as intuitive as possible. Probably not drop downs, not like it's going to be on a phone in in most cases here. So probably not like, you know, the typical like expanding sliding menus, probably something as simple as possible for the navigation. So and since it's outside, I would definitely put a lot of consideration into color contrast as well. I'd go I'd go well beyond the spec there because you got to think you know not everybody has the most uh, the latest OLED bright million nits whatever brightness screen right on their phone <laughs> maybe some people do right but most people on average have a typical phone and and um so I would up that color contrast quite a bit um and to make sure that it's readable outside in the sunlight so it's so finally like as far as the QR code now, I think this is probably the biggest consideration to think about. I think if you have a QR code on, you know, I don't know if it's on a pedestal or right next to, uh, you know, right next to the monument or or, or is that what it's sculptures or something, right? Um, I, I think you have to have clear instructions right next to that QR code. And I think that you need to... Uh, you need to explain the accessible features of that QR code and maybe offer some alternative because like that's going to be hard for, you know, uh, somebody that's not a sighted user to be able to scan a QR code with, with a, with a phone. Now, I think the phones are pretty good about these days have accessible features to help you take pictures of people and, you know, where to move it and stuff. But I, I'd be real cautious about that and take extra steps to make sure that that's accessible. Um, and and I'd be curious what, what Raga yeah, has yeah. to say about like this this answer, like scanning QR codes outside and visiting a website to learn about a piece of artwork. Like how detailed would you want it to be and what features would you need? So I think Steve I guess, covered most Braille? of it. Do, do you no, want Braille no, next I don't, to the QR I, code? I don't know Braille. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I don't okay. know Braille. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah. So some people might want Braille next to the QR yeah. code, like on the sign, right, telling them there's a QR code there. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. But because it, you, you you need to be specific, you know, because if it's a straight, if it, if it's a offline QR code on the paper, what happens is, if where should I put the phone? Where yeah. is it? Yeah. So you need a tactile type of thing, you know, where, or there's a symbol or something where I can. Yeah. Is like an alternative URL a good solution? Yep. Okay. So I don't use QR codes in public spaces a lot uh, because I'm afraid of the security. I have yeah, an iPhone <laughs> and it's so many people around me. I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah because totally. it, it's very difficult to take your phone and you know waving it in the air and like did it come did it come and there's a lot of noise you can't hear voiceover with if you're in the public <laughs> space <laughs> yeah yeah that's true yeah. the security thing is is something to be mindful of you know we were at a conference last year i think and amber and i ran into a data scientist right or right he was a data scientist or something like that, and he had a QR code on his phone, like ready to go. And Amber just scanned it. I was like, "Up, oh, he's got you now, Amber." <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that to like get his contact information, yeah, yeah. like his LinkedIn and all this stuff. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So. But I'm curious on the on the actual text on the website. If you were wanting to learn about a sculpture or a piece of artwork or something, how descriptive would you want the wording about it to be? And like, what do you feel like are important details that someone would want to consider when they're trying to decide how much to write about a piece of artwork. I go in like how, how a sighted person describes it. So not everyone, like I got with a lot of friends to museums and art places. Some people are very artistic and creative in describing the art stuff. So mm -hmm. those are the people that I want to be around with because they make even a restaurant or the usual things like you know, someone, uh, a police standing near the traffic signal, a friend of mine describes it so well. Mm -hmm. And 
that that gives me a mind that mind's eye view of what's happening around me so same thing to do with you know artwork you have to be cre you need to hire someone who's creative and keeps it simple not uh so i i read a lot of simple english so how simple can it be plain language mm -hmm. yeah reading level is probably really important if we're talking general public we want it to be eighth grade or lower yeah um yeah not really complex yeah that makes total sense um so we... i don't think hold on i was just thinking i'm gonna let you go to your next question but i realized we didn't say this so we had a few questions that we got ahead of time so we have those um, but we are going to get to questions in the Q and A as well, so feel free to put those in. But I just wanted to give everyone that background. <laughs> oh, yep. Yeah. Um, so on the sales side, Simon asked, "How did Equalize Digital generate leads and convert them to paying clients when you were first starting out? What strategies would you recommend to a new web accessibility agency looking to grow its client base?" Um, Chris, do you want to start with this one? Yeah, and I'm I'm popping these in the chat as we go <clears throat> for these questions we received ahead of time. So uh, I'm happy to speak to this first, and I spent some time reflecting on this this morning since we got some time or since we got this question in advance. Uh, I'll provide the the short version first, which is we tried a lot of things, like a lot of things, and we we failed a lot of times mm -hmm. before we figured things out. And I think that's the the first thing, you know, if you're feeling uh, frustrated or discouraged, and I'm not insinuating that the person that, that that's asking this question is feeling that way. But if you're a person out there who's feeling frustrated or discouraged, because you feel like you're working your butt off and nothing's catching, um, just keep trying new things. Um, but here's what worked for us. So I have a list of, of six different things. And I don't know if they necessarily have to happen in exactly this order, but I do feel like they kind of build on one another. Um, so the first one, and maybe the most critical is to specialize in something that you believe there is, or is going to be demand for, and that you genuinely have a reason to care about, um, and try to make this narrow. So start narrow and try to own that narrow space, right. And then expand outward from there rather than being the everything person, right. Who will do anything. Um, that someone comes to you for, like a, a digital marketing generalist. Not that that's not valuable. It's just that lumps you in with a lot of people versus being a specialist. Um, also, as you go, if you decide what to go into, interview existing or prospective customers, ask them what they need, what's keeping them awake at, at night and build offers around those things. So that's number one. Number two, do everything you can to be present relevant and provide real value for people who need the thing you're going to specialize in. So that's creating articles, podcasts, public speaking, meetups, right? We're all here. <laughs> um, so do those things. Like you're engaging in a marketing effort right now for us. This is WordPress Accessibility Meetup. We run it as volunteers, right? But this has a marketing benefit for Equalize Digital, but we're also providing you with a lot of value, right? So you need to find things that you can do within whatever you want to specialize in where you're doing the same thing. You're providing value, but you're also creating a positive marketing outcome for yourself. Uh, can I number three. chime in real quick on this point? Like, or the first one, maybe? Like one thing I think that's worthwhile to think about is that accessibility, like it is a niche, but it also is really broad. And so like I was talking to someone who they are in Northern California and they've started doing a lot of work with wineries and like becoming the person who does not just like winery websites, but like accessibility for wineries. Like, you know, oh, maybe you are the one who really knows about reservation platforms. <laughs> Which mm -hmm. reservation platforms are accessible and which ones are not? Or e-commerce, if they're able to sell, you know, like wines of the month subscriptions or something like that. So like thinking even maybe more niche, which I know mm -hmm. sounds weird because we're not just <laughs> like <laughs> that thing. But I, I do feel like like what you're to give a more concrete example to what Chris is saying, I think it's helpful to think about like who like the tighter you get in your audience. I think that yeah. can be more yeah. helpful. Be, the, being a niche of a niche does not hurt. Yeah. Um, the yeah. riches are in the niches, right? <laughs> um, so I'm going to, I'm going to hop to number three. I love that. I might put that on a t-shirt, Steve. Yes. <laughs> um, so number three on my list was have ways to passively or as passively as possible, get people's information so that you can contact them, then give them even more value 
and then eventually ask them to collaborate with or hire you. So really a list of engaged customers and potential customers is hands down your most valuable business asset. And if you aren't building that right now, you should start, find a way to start. Number four, and this is where I have, I've literally been doing this for years and the process always changes and evolves, but have a heavily dialed in process for sales and connect it to a CRM where you can track and measure things. So have scripts for calls, emails, task sequences for every stage of a deal's life cycle. Don't be afraid to call people, be friendly and helpful even when you get a no and recommend other companies if they're a better fit. Build referral relationships with those companies you're recommending. Be proactive and patient because, and this is a rule in sales, effort today yields results in like 90 to 120 days. So what you did four or five months ago is going to have ripple effects, you know, today. So consistent effort gives better dividends than, you know, a bunch of effort, like little pockets of a lot of effort, right? Um, number five, go out and meet your peers. Kind of like what you're doing right now, right? You're networking with another one another in the chat. Maybe you go to WordCamp events. Maybe you go to events in your community. Get out there and meet people. Get coaching and mentorship. Try to build relationships with people who are 10 years ahead of you in business, at least one person that you can reach out to and ask for advice. And number six, and then I'll be quiet and let other people answer this question because I know I'm not the only person with valuable advice here. Uh, don't stop improving. So we've collectively, like this team, and there's people, there's members of this team who aren't on this call, right? This is like maybe a, a what do you think, Amber? Like a third or half the team, right? There's there's um, there's a bunch of other people who aren't here, but uh, we've achieved a lot, but there are probably, arguably, like a hundred things we, we want to fix about our company like right now. Um, and after those 100 things are done, there's going to be another hundred things, right? So just constantly improve. You're never done. Yeah. No. So uh, like circling back, I think to the initial of just like attracting people, I think it's worth saying that, um, what has been most beneficial for us, one is creating really good quality content. Um, like I published the blog, a blog post over the weekend, last weekend about WCAG 2.2, it's almost a 6,000 word blog post and it has tons of screenshots and a lot of detailed. And then I saw today that my friend Kyle in the admin bar shared it in his Facebook group. I never asked him to do that. He just did it. But I think like if, if you're creating really helpful, meaningful content, then that makes people want to share it with other people and keep coming back to you. Um, and I think like, that's really important over the, I see sometimes where people are publishing these like 800 word blog posts that are just kind of like half an idea. Is what I'm mm -hmm. feeling sometimes yeah. when I read them. Right. And, and I'm like, no, one's going to share that. Uh, Raga, you, and, and maybe you can follow up with your experience as a freelancer, but you do a lot of this like content creation. And I think that brings people back to your website, right? Yes. Uh, the digital Eleanor gets about quarter million visitors a year and it's purely driven on content and uh if i come across of anything let's just say someone today when we spoke about qr codes the idea is still in my mind so i already noted that i haven't written about qr codes so maybe mm -hmm. that is one so uh, when, when i come across anything like last week i was in a restaurant and the staff is not engaging with me but with my sighted partner so why is it do they think only sighted people pay the bill or they can choose what is for the blind people? So I'm, I'm writing on that. So the, I, what happens is once you start creating content, you see patterns everywhere that you can create content of. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, the last post that I wrote is on WordPress because uh, I was working with a designer who told, you are saying add the call to action button, but you know what? It reads as a link in the screen data. Why do you need a visual button when it's a link and we wrote a blog post on that is it a really link or a button the cta should be what is it so mm -hmm. we i create a lot of content and that brings visitors that brings people asking i do a lot of mentorship i i run a largest accessibility community out of india networking uh, i don't travel anymore but Otherwise, I would have traveled to speak at engagements or be in the conferences. So whatever Chris covered, I do all of that. 
Yeah, I would say like that's another big area that I put into, um, which I'm not doing as much right now. But the first couple of years that we created Equalize and we had pivoted from our just generalist marketing agency into Equalize, I put a lot of effort into doing podcast interviews. I like podcast interviews because it gets you in front of someone else's audience. And it's not like the the 6,000 word blog post, you guys, it took me like <laughs> 10 hours to write mm -hmm. that and create all the screenshots and find all the examples, right? It's a huge time investment. A podcast interview is like you talk with them a little bit via email or on a podcast matching platform. Um, Podmatch, I think, is the one that I found the best out of the ones I tried, but I can follow up on that. Um, but let, but then you like show up for like an hour <laughs> and you just talk <laughs> and then it goes out. So I do feel like if creating all that content is hard, like that is a good way to get in front of other people's audience and like share your knowledge um, and and kind of attract more attention. Yeah, those are great answers, everyone. Um, so moving on to the next one, Tonia has developed a WordPress site using MailSuite, a WordPress platform for the U.S. Department of Defense, and says that she has no idea how to make it accessible. She mentioned she's not tech savvy, oh, a muggle, and doesn't know <laughs> much about plugins. Amber, where would you recommend that she can start? Yeah. So I I actually, when I saw this come in, I was all like, I messaged her to be like, can I view this? She sent us a URL. I was like, can I view this? Because I tried to go there and it wanted me to log in with my uh, Department of Defense credentials. She's like, oh, no, it's not public. Because uh, I was like, it'd be good if we can give some. But I would say, like, if you are not a tech savvy person, um, the best place to start is probably by using some of the automated testing tools and just fixing some of the things that you can. Um, so I don't know. She probably doesn't have the ability to install an accessibility checker on there. She should go talk to her, mm -hmm. <laughs> whoever runs that, because I'm sure it's a multi-site or a network. Um, and they have the ability to install and get them to install it. But if not, like using Wave would be great if she's able to scan it with Wave. I would think about the things that I think about for a non-tech savvy person that can really have meaningful value is um, just doing some quick testing with your tab key and make sure that you can get through the navigation menu um, that like when you tab to sub items, it actually opens and is visible to you and isn't just hidden. Um, I would say check your headings, make sure you're using headings in the correct order. We talked about that headings map browser extension. Um, link, having links that are meaningful. So don't link the word here, click here, learn more, like links that actually communicate something about where they're going can be really important. Um, we always talk about alt text on images, describing images. The other thing that comes to mind when I think about this as like a, a government website is, I don't know if it has like charts and graphs and tables, but if it does, then um, for any sort of graph, if it's just like a screenshot of a bar chart, for example, you need to also provide a table of that data so that um, people who can't view the image can still access the same information. Um, or you would also want to think about not using color alone. Like sometimes in graphs, it's like the red and the green mean different things, but to someone who's red, green, colorblind, it looks exactly the same. And we're looking at a you know, a, a bar chart, we have no idea how to tell what those are. So maybe having patterns on your bar charts, if you're creating them. Um, and, you know, you would do that wherever you create it, like in Excel or sheets, you'd apply a pattern to it instead of um, just having a solid color. And then, um, of course, making sure your tables have appropriate headers, because that's a big mistake that people forget. They just put everything in as table data, and then maybe they make it bold. So it looks like a header, but it's not really a header. Those are some things that come to mind for me. Um, what about you, Raga? I think we did not touch base on forms, you know, visible labels for form oh, yes, fields, forms. avoiding placeholders and mm -hmm. appropriate error messages and easy to find error messages, not just, <laughs> you know, not in line, just, you know, give even links on the top of the form. That's one. And avoid carousels if you can, uh, you know, that are auto moving then you know keep i think you should keep the uh, navigations consistent and uh, that's all from me 
I think yeah, a lot of WordPress websites I come across as forms. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think I, I think sometimes in organizations, you know, such as government or higher ed, right? You have to you have to uh to achieve the accessibility stuff that you would like to achieve or need to achieve, sometimes you have to become an advocate. You got to seek out the departments that actually do uh, have the ability to make the changes in the platforms they're using. And uh, so I, I wouldn't be afraid to like try to find out who those people are, identify them, send out emails to them, put, you know, I don't know if they have a track or something, open a ticket to see if you can get uh, some change made on those sites from the people that actually can access the platform. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think this, uh, I think, you know, if they are able to partner with an accessibility specialist, whether there is one internally at the Department of Defense, or if not, um, you know, bringing in an outside vendor, I think would probably be helpful. Um, and making sure, you know, that sort of thing, both the testing is done, but also that there's training resources available for people that are using MillSuite. Obviously, I've never accessed it because I'm not in the military, so I have no idea, but <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, I'll, uh, chime yeah. in just one more thing. Sorry. Uh, but, uh, Tanya, I, I know just like from, from the perspective of not really knowing where to start, if you wanted to send me an email, Chris at equalizedigital.com, I'm not going to sell you anything. I just happen to be working on an ebook right now with a partnership in partnership with another organization that's focused on like real world steps that more novice people can take to start to tackle accessibility meaningfully. And if you email me, I will just send you some, some stuff that I have drafted that will give you some things that you can take to start to make like at least at the very least the content on the page more accessible and introduce some better best practices there. It, it wouldn't get you to a hundred percent, but it would be a starting point and maybe is uh approachable, right? As a list of best practices to introduce. Happy to do that if you want to send me a note. That was all I was going to say. Yeah, um, those are great tips, everyone. Um, so let's talk about ways to learn accessibility. Um, Steve, can you start off with some resources that you found helpful when you were learning to code from an accessibility first perspective? Sure. Um, my my intro into accessibility is a little different than I think most because uh, we had done some accessibility uh, stuff early on in our previous agency. And, uh, but then I was tasked, you know, we came up with the idea to make the accessibility checker. So to make a, a, a tool that evaluates for accessibility, you got to learn it. And you got, and I was drinking from a fire hose. So like it was, it was a lot at first, but there's some, there's some practical places where you can go. I mean, there's documentation, uh, there's the WCAG guidelines. I think that we all re reference those as the official docs. And, uh, you know, as Amber mentioned, she has written a gigantic blog post uh, with a supplement for the WCAG 2.2 guidelines. We also have an Accessibility Craft podcast episode about that that is out or is coming out. Not sure. It came out on Monday. Oh, it came out this Monday. So the latest episode <laughs> of Accessibility Craft. So check that out. Um, um, those are kind of the official docs. And and there's a lot of good code examples in there uh, that are help. Um, as a developer, uh, I, I'll use the, the Mozilla MDM docs. Uh, they have some pretty good accessibility docs. Uh, they're not official, but I have found those very useful. And they explain things to me in a developer kind of way. And uh, and they kind of get to the point, right? Like as a developer, I just want to know the right way to do it. I don't want, you know, a lot of times I don't want to get caught up in all the words, right? Um, and also, I mean, uh, you know, not to keep tooting our own horn, but our ex our equalize our equalized digital accessibility checker documentation is 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 very well written. Uh, Amber has done a, a fantastic job of writing that documentation. And to be honest, if if you know if I'm working on a a client website and I see an error in the accessibility checker, and and I'm not 100 sure, and I made the accessibility checker right, like so, <laughs> I'll click on that link and I'll run over to to the documentation and Amber's got it uh, listed out. You know, like you know this is what it should look like, right? So there's you know 
this is what's wrong and this is what it should look, look like, like with code examples. And I love that. And it's super helpful. So the accessibility checker is not just a, it's not just scanning and telling you what's wrong, right? It's kind of an education tool of sorts, right? It, it, it highlights what's wrong. And then we provide you with documentation on how to resolve that. So uh, next there's browser extensions. And we've mentioned a few of those already here on, on this meetup. Um, but uh, there's the, you know, wave, which is a, you know, a front end, you know, it's a browser extension. Um, that evaluates uh, one page at a time, just like a front end evaluation. It's a great tool. Uh, another one uh, similar to that is like the Axe Dev Tools. Um, I'll use that quite a bit. Uh, Google Lighthouse, which is built into the Chrome browser or most Chromium browsers if you use a, another browser like Brave. Um, we mentioned the Headings Map extension. Um, that's that's great. You you. You just hit that and it pops up on the side and it shows you shows you your heading. It'll highlight ones that are out of order. Um, there, there's a, a colorblindly that we've used that kind of simulates uh, it, it simulates like uh, like the way different people perceive colors, right? I don't know if I'm explaining that correctly, but uh, yeah, and different types of colorblindness. Yeah, different different yeah. types of colorblindness. That's a cool tool. And then uh, another one that we've used frequently is called Tabally. It's T-A-B-A-L-L-Y. Uh, and that one, uh, uh, you initiate that browser extension and it basically goes through and it maps the tab order of the website. And it kinda, it's kind of, from a visual standpoint, it's cool because it like draws a line, a visual line from the first tab order, the second, third, right down the page. And you can see where if your tab order is off, it'll highlight that. So those are great tools and super low barrier of entry for the browser extensions to just start getting in there and playing around and, and seeing what's actually wrong. And, and in that process, you're kind of start to learn these things and absorb them. Um, moving more into development stuff, there's there's like a, you could use some linters. Now in WordPress world, we still are real heavily in PHP. So it's not always super easy to lint PHP. Um, so when I say linting, it's in your IDE and your IDE has a, like I use Visual Studio Code and you can install plugins inside of uh, Visual Studio Code that can then check code as you're coding. So like if I, if I'm, if I'm writing, a, you know, like a React block, right, for WordPress and I write something that's inaccessible, it'll highlight it and tell me why it's not accessible. And so the little linter that I'll use for that is the 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 Axe accessibility accessibility linters. So um and that's for Visual Studio Code. You can just go in there, plug in search Axe accessibility linter. And uh that's probably the best one that I've seen and probably really the only one that I I use in in my IDE for that. Um Moving away from the code stuff, uh, I think it, you move into like testers and and uh, evaluation. So there's like uh, screen readers. Like uh, if you're not familiar with using a screen reader, I would I would suggest get in get in there. Like uh, if you're on a Mac, you can use Voiceover. If you're on a PC, you can use NVDA uh, or Jaws, which I think Jaws costs money. But uh, um, just initiating that on your computer and using it and see what it tells you and and you know be brave close your eyes and try to use your keyboard to tab through a website and and experience what it's what it's like to not to be able to see the website and uh if you're writing code like if you're writing a modal or a, or some tabs um you know uh something that expands some something that loads dynamic content uh, test it with the screen reader and and see what that experience is like. Um, as long uh, as it's just learning by doing. Yeah, it totally is, and that's I, I that's the kind of person I am. I'm totally like if you give me like a whole bunch of documentation to read, I'm gonna no way, I'm not gonna do it, right? Like, but <laughs> like, but like if you tell me we have to achieve this, right, and it has to meet this, and I'll go like, okay, I could figure that out, right? And I'm like okay, so these tabs. Like these tabs, I go to these tabs and it hits the first tab. Like I'm talking about like a tab, you know, dynamic dynamic content tabs on a website. It hits the first tab and then it just jumps down 
pass, it doesn't go through all the tabs, right? So now I need to code in something, you know, to grab that tab and to announce to the screen reader that it is a tab, and then to use the arrow keys to go back and forth between all the tabs in that that component. Um, so yeah, it is a lot of learning by doing and 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 exploring and playing. I mean, the, it's it's vital. Um, so there's WordPress plugins as well. We've mentioned ours quite a few times, our accessibility checker plugin. Um, install the install that, go to a post or page, save a post or page, see what it says, right? Like it'll list out errors or warnings. And uh, typically errors are things that can be programmatically found pretty accurately. And warnings are typically things that require a human to audit and evaluate that and and resolve it and you can click on it and then you can hit the view on page and it'll just jump you around uh, over to the front end of the website and highlight that issue on the page for you. Um, there are some other accessibility plugins that kind of help make your website more accessible, which we've, uh, uh, the WP accessibility plugin by Joe Dawson um, uh, is very helpful in that regard, adding skip links and things like that. Uh, so check those out, explore those. And then finally, like, I know this is a long list, but uh, finally, um, I would say, uh, you know, I'm lucky enough to have have auditors and testers testing my code, such as Amber and Raghavendra. Um, but, and Chris has mentioned this too, it's about community too. Like, uh, you know, utilize, utilize uh, Slack groups, utilize Twitter. Like if you're stuck on an accessibility issue, put it out there, I'm, I'm sure, Probably one of us will will chime in. Uh, there's Facebook groups. We've got a Facebook group that is amazing for uh, for questions like that. So uh, utilize your community. Utilize people on your team. To uh, it's always good to have a second, you know, uh, set of eyes on something, even if they're not the the accessibility ex expert, right? Um, so. Yeah, it's a long list, but might, that's what I have. Yeah. <laughs> I have so I might throw two in, and then I think um, Paula was going to switch us over to doing questions in the Q and A. Yeah. But the ones that I'll just say real quick, as far as like learning resources that are helpful. So the A Eleven Y Collective, which is um, a project started by some people from Level Level in the Netherlands, they have a lot of training videos that are useful. And then of course, um, Raga and I and Peter, who's here, and Isla, and Adrian, and some other people who are attending are all um, organizers of WordPress Accessibility Day. Um, and I just put a link to, if you go to wpaccessibility.day slash pass dash events, uh, you can actually watch all of the videos for free um, from the past WordPress Accessibility Days. And so I highly recommend that as a training resource as well. Yeah, thank you. Uh, that was very comprehensive. Now yeah. we're going to go jump into the Q&A that you guys have been posting. Um, the first one that I'm going to call is Laurel. What kind of training or certifications do you think are necessary in order to specialize in accessible WordPress design? And I wonder if Raga, do you want to talk about this? Because you probably have the most certifications out of all of us on this call. <laughs> yeah. So I think more than certifications, we need to know the fundamentals of accessibility because certifications help uh, to enhance your knowledge. That's what I realized. So I learned accessibility. Uh, first, I learned HTML from W3 schools. Then I learned accessibility by doing it rather than when I got started in 2008, 2009, there's very few resources available online back then. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, what I learned from W3C uh, websites and other places is, you know, when you practice it and when you come work with other accessibility professionals, you get a lot of clarity on what is really, uh, you know, a failure of WCAG or is it usable? Is it a great design experience for someone with uh, disability? That is where the thing is, because uh, when I did certifications, they enhanced my knowledge because I had to go read a ton of stuff. Um, I did IAP, CPACC, where I learned about uh, various disability types, universal design, universal design for learning. And when I did web accessibility specialist, uh, I need to learn 
uh, a bit of JavaScript. I learned CSS. So I did, uh, I went to edx.org. I did uh, fundamentals of JavaScript, HTML, CSS. So that is where course the certification self, but always, you know, stick to the fundamentals where you're creating any accessible website, either it is on WordPress or any platform. Uh, in WordPress, you know, by default, you get a lot of accessible themes now, uh, either 2023, 2022 theme, and there are a lot of plugins out there. And we all spoke about accessibility checker on WordPress, but uh, at the same time, you need to do a lot of testing before you choose which plugin or which theme. Because um, I really found out that there are plugins out there that says, oh, we are ADA compliant. And I was testing on Carousel uh, just yesterday. And it, the previous next buttons are just read as buttons. And the Carousel content is hidden uh, visually with because they used ARIA hidden on the entire content. Mm. So th there's a lot of learning you need to have both technically and from the user side of it, the user usability side of it, because you want to make it easy rather than, so there's two things here, making it accessible, making usable. It should be going in hand in hand. Yeah. So Sorry. do you feel like the certifications are, um, they're not necessarily the best way to learn, but I'm assuming, you know, certifications can maybe help with getting clients. Has that yes. been your experience? Yes. So certifications are not definitely to learn. So if you want to learn about accessibility, you want to do audits, um, uh, I would suggest the, the DHS Trusted Tester. It's a very thorough course on how to perform accessibility audits for WCAG. And there are steps outlined on how to test each success criteria and all that. Um, but the course is defined... Uh, defined in such a way that you learn really because there's a lot of practice work that goes into it and then you have to score about 90 percent to pass the exam so you learn the technicalities of auditing but if you want to really learn accessibility you have to keep doing the work day in day out learning new things uh, as steve said you have to build your own sometimes code samples test them out uh uh, I do a lot of work in that space because that's the only way I, I realized I learned. And certifications come in handy to, you know, get new employment. And lately when clients ask, are you IAP certified? Are you, do you, are you a certified accessibility consultant? This is one of the re recent and last one year, this I'm hearing a lot. Thank you. Um, going on to our next question, um, Karina asks, can you explain the governing body behind the efforts around WCAG? Are these guidelines a good approach for international compliance instead of just US, US focused? Are there other international standards we should be aware of for multinational brands? Um, if anyone wants to take yeah. that one. <laughs> so the governing body behind WCAG, WCAG is basically what would be considered like an open source project. So anyone can volunteer and contribute to it. Um, the short, and I'm going to try, I know we're like, I'm going to try and go fast because I want to get through everyone's, but I'm going to say the short answer on, are they a good approach for international compliance? Yes. Um, people who contribute to them are around the world and there are laws around the world that reference them. They're the best standard for testing or measuring accessibility that we have worldwide. They're not just US focused. Um, the only other thing is there are some things like I know in the EU, they have some in the EU or European Union, they have some laws that are specific um, that don't necessarily reference WCAG, but also have their own guidelines. So you may need to check with a specific country um, if you're really worried about legal compliance, I always recommend talking to a legal professional, of which none of us are. <laughs> um, but but yeah, I would say using WCAG outside the U.S. works well. Yeah, and and I'll just um, add to that the idea of you know uh, compliance with laws versus compliance with standards. This is a very this is a very gray area. Um, and some solutions will promise that they will make you comply with specific laws. 
um, even though if you actually read the legal text of the laws themselves, they don't create like they, the law, the legal text does not create a qualitative or excuse me, a quantitative measurable accessibility standard that you can actually prove. It'll say something like it offers an equivalent experience. That's more of a qualitative or very subjective way of analyzing accessibility. That's not that one is more, um, I don't know, valuable than the other, right? But it's just in terms of standards, you really want to hold yourself to the thing that is most measurable, most quantifiable, that can be proven, that can be charted on a graph, right? Um, because that is ultimately what it is uh, provable that can be shown to, you know, whether it's, um, you know, a lawyer um, or just someone who's registering a complaint or a, a regulator, whatever it is. Um, and that's why WCAG is often referenced because it really is the most comprehensive standard that exists. Thank you. Great answer. Um, going on to the next question, Simon asks, I currently write articles for my blog in Markdown and then make layout and visual edits in Elementor. Do you know of a more accessible, friendly content editor for WordPress, both in terms of accessi accessible usage and ensuring that the content on the page being edited is accessible. Raga, do you want to respond on, I'd be curious, what's your, what do you think is the best, most accessible way to edit content in WordPress? So I follow multi-step here. What I do is I write everything in Word document. I tag all the headings list, then I use I don't use Elementor, I use Gutenberg because it outputs accessible mm -hmm. semantic HTML. But when you post it, the Word document in Gutenberg, it creates all the blocks automatically and you don't have to do a, a lot of tweaking. Just in case, you know, if there is something that is not accessible when I'm testing on the front end, uh, there's a code, like you can view the entire code. I can go change the code in the editor. So this is one way. So people who find it difficult with screen reader to move into Gutenberg and edit, what you can do is uh, you can enable the classic editor after you put everything in Gutenberg and see where you want to edit the content, edit that piece of content and then disable the classic editor. Oh, that's an interesting idea to go back and forth between two. I know a lot of people have said that you know, there's still some major accessibility challenges in the block editor. I know from an accessibility standpoint, a lot of the um, blind users that I've spoken with do use the classic editor plugin and they're always, um, I mean, you're really tech savvy. So maybe you've figured out workarounds. Yeah, um, I figured out the block yes. editor. Because yeah. I, I've been using Gutenberg since its version, it's initially released it. And uh, mm -hmm. it improved a lot when it comes to uh, using with screen reader because you can do a basic blog uh, where I couldn't do uh, tabs, accordions, and tables as successfully as uh, a sighted person could do it because you need to yeah. go through multiple. So what I do even tables and, and the, when a classicator was there, I used to write all the HTML code or use a table generator, put all my content in there, take the HTML, put it in the text, form of the classicator and move on from there. But Gutenberg is very different. You need to have a sighted person work on some of the aspects in the blocks, definitely. Yeah, I think from a, like the quick answer on, in my opinion, and feel free to conflict me, anyone here or disagree, but I, I think that if you're using WordPress core blocks and not custom blocks from a block library, the most accessible experience will be with the block editor rather than some sort of um, page builder like Elementor or Beaver Builder or um, I don't know, any of them, Oxygen. And I'm not mm -hmm. trying to like call out any specific one, like all of them pretty much. I think from an editing standpoint. Yes. Block editor is going to be better than any of those third-party tools. I don't um, deny it because I use some page builders. I couldn't even uh, get to the edit screen and understand at least the text fields or what is the field names are. 
Yeah. And then I think like on the other side of that question, like ensuring the most accessible output, I kind of think it's the same way because, and that's why we've ended up one of the many reasons, but why we don't use any outside block libraries anymore. Like it's either core blocks or we build our own because most of the, even the block library collections are not doing adequate accessibility testing and they're releasing blocks that sometimes have major deficits. Mm -hmm. Like you were talking about Raga, like it said, double A compliant, and then it had unlabeled buttons on a carousel content couldn't even be accessed, right? Um, so I don't know, that's not a great answer for people who like page builders. <laughs> but I think if you really care about accessibility, you really have to start thinking about the page builder that you're using. And if there is one that, that is really important to you, like talk to them and tell them how important accessibility is. And hopefully you can, like like if you open issues on their GitHub or on in their WordPress support forum, like maybe that will help them to see where there are problems. And I've had good luck with them making fixes when I've said, hey, this doesn't work in this space, so. Yeah, thank you for that one. Um, moving on to the next question, FJ Nelson asks, simple question, perhaps. Google page speed often flags links in the body content as needing more than colors to distinguish them from non-linked text. A lot of my clients don't like underlined links. I sometimes get away with a light dotted underline, which satisfies accessibility checking. But what are some suggestions for links, other teammates, other treatments for links beyond just colors? Okay, let's round robin this. Everybody say, I think that your links in body text have to have an underline. Does yep. anyone, <laughs> or do we all feel the same way? Strongly agree. agree. Strongly yep. agree. <laughs> And Rag is the certified professional here. What do you think? Underlines make it easy. All my site, <laughs> I work with a lot of cited assistant. And I say, here is a link. They're like, no, it's just paragraph. And then I click on it and they say, yeah, I changed color. <laughs> so there's a link. <laughs> yeah. So, I, yeah. I, I literally think that that should be a WCAG failure. So, I mean, technically they have, it doesn't say they have to be underlined. They have to look different. But the thing is, is like, you can't just make it bold because sometimes people use bold for emphasis. You can't just make it italics because sometimes they use italic. So then it's like, okay, well, maybe you don't underline it and you have a color, but you have another little icon next to it that denotes it's a link. But then at this, but then I'm like, that's even more distracting than an underline when you're reading, right? Yeah, I think there's something to be said about uh, standardization too. Like, you know, like you said, it may not be a violation if you use another method, but everybody's just underlining them when, right? Like that's- This is why we don't underline for emphasis because I've seen literally on heat mapping on websites when something was underlined like for decoration that yeah. people tried to click it because yes. human beings yes. see that and think it's a link. Yes. <laughs> Because yeah. I've been I, tracking I think, ra um, rage clicks on some websites and that happens. They click on person. underlined text. Yeah. 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 Yep. Clicky, clicky, clicky. Yep. I've seen <laughs> that on, on screen recorders um, where someone's trying to click something that isn't clickable. So you can have the opposite effect or unintended effect if you use underlines, uh, you know, not for what they're intended for. That's kind of the flip side of this question. The other the other thing I would say too, and, and I've had this, uh, we've done this, you know, in interactions with customers who are pushing back about a particular design element that they say looks quote dated or just isn't what they want or quote doesn't match their brand. And one thing that often often um, helps those conversations is if you can provide aspirational examples of people doing the right thing. So if you have a public sector organization who's saying, we think underlines are horrible, we don't want our links to be underlined, show them whitehouse.gov yeah. or show them, you know, uh, I don't know, uh, nasa.gov, right? Which just relaunched in WordPress. Guarantee you those links are underlined uh, on those websites. So we... We just, I just had this conversation actually with a client. We launched their website last year and then they've had a turnover in their marketing VP has changed. Um, and the new person came and they're like, can we remove the underlines from links? It, they just jump out. They stand out too much. I don't like it. So I'm like explaining why. And they're like, plus I don't see other organizations doing this. Like they <laughs> So, yeah. and, and I think they even mentioned like the New York times. And I was like, what are you talking about? I swear the New York times has underlines on their links. So I went and looked and I was like, okay, yes, they do. And I screenshotted for them. And I was like, 
I was looking at it, I was like, you know, I think part of why yours stand out so much is because they have a really bright blue that's almost like the blue in Equalized Digital Branding, like our color. And like, that was what their links were. And I was like, look at the New York Times. Like they're using more of a teal color. <laughs> so it still is, passes color contrast, but it's not this like bright. And they're like, oh yeah, we like this. So we ended up just changing the color of their links so they wouldn't quote stand out as much. So sometimes you have to get it like, what's the underlining reason that they don't want that? And maybe there's a way to design it so that it's still like on the WordPress accessibility website, we don't actually use color at all to denote links. They're the same color as the surrounding text. We just use an underline, yeah. right? So they're black. So, you know, maybe there are ways to do it. And now we're going too long. All right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah great answer, everyone. Um, for the next one, Laurel asks, when a website has a lot of accessibility issues that are being addressed through a redesign, what can be done to protect the company from accessibility lawsuits before the web the website redesign is finished? Mm -hmm. An accessibility statement, right? So that I think what I've heard from a lot of attorneys in the space, and again, we're not here giving legal advice, is that having an accessibility statement really helps. And your accessibility statement should say, number one, how to get help. That is probably the most important thing. And it needs to be a real way to get help, not like a contact form that goes to nowhere. Yeah. And it should list known issues, right? Yeah, I don't think you have yes. to. Yeah. But yeah, you're gonna say that rugged. Like it's a best practice to list yes, known it's issues. It's a best practice because if there are any blockers that is there, it's better to list and tell that you're working on them. And uh, what I also realized is, uh, as Amber is saying about contact, it should be very easy and you need a phone number. They want to talk to someone on the other side mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. who is empathetic yeah. and who understands, you know, that uh, people always have seen um, in some of the lawsuits is we don't see a disability help desk phone number, mm -hmm. which is very specific. So you might need the right language also. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I um the other thing that I've seen so we've done some remediation with universities that were and colleges that were under mandated remediation with the um, Office of Civil Rights, which is part of the U.S. Department of Education, and they've actually advocated. So, like this one community college, for example, the, the platform that people can register for, like the lifelong learning classes. It's a third-party platform that is totally not accessible. And they can't, but we couldn't fix it. Community college couldn't fix it. And the vendor was like, yeah, we're not fixing it. So they're like, okay, well, we're going to have to find a new platform, but it's going to take us time. And the one thing the Office of Civil Rights said is they're like, okay, we'll consider this a pass. But what they had to do was not just in their accessibility statement, right above the link to go register, they had to put a message that says, this platform is not accessible. Here are the alternate ways. And so like thinking about too, like having it outside of your accessibility statement, because that was the big thing the Office of Civil Rights said was they're like, don't make people waste their time. Like, if you know that this doesn't work, don't make them go there and figure it out. <laughs> like, tell them and tell them what they can do to to get the more accessible version. So I think that's probably the other thing that possibly could be done on a website while you're in process of building a new one or remediating. Great answers, team. I'm um, going to the next one. Nada asks, hi, I'm a software trainer at a media company. I train linguistics on how to use a scripting tool to create docs and audio descriptions. We are starting to hire blind QCers to review the audio descriptions to make sure they are accurate and accessibility friendly. They will be using our software, which we've made accessible. My question is, do you have any resources or advice on how to best conduct training for blind users? I make online courses, one on one on one trainings, documentation, etc. I would love to hear your exp your experience in training. I want to make sure I am inclusive in my speech and make the QCers feel comfortable. Do you want to answer this one, Raga? So um, this is with regard to e-learning, how to make e-learning content accessible. Okay. So if it is a training yeah, program. Yeah, or just at, like how yeah. to train 
how to train people who are blind on testing. On testing? That's that's how I understood this question to be. Okay. So So yeah, go ahead. I I think it's all about guidance when we do testing uh someone with blindness already who using screen readers, they know how to use screen readers, but they don't know the product that they're testing. So having someone, I always have a site assist that helps me identify what is there. Or either they explain how the platform looks visually before I start testing it. And once I test it, I'll tell what I understood and they'll correct me from that. Uh, if it is e-learning content, I, I do test e-learning content. Uh, when a lot of videos are there, it's uh, blind people prefer not to. So this is like personally me and I, I work with a lot of fr friends and community that I know. We read a lot of transcripts rather than videos because screen reader is much faster than listening to. And we can jump to words, spellings where we want. That is how we access e-learning content. So transcripts, those are must for us. Yeah, thank you. And uh, just to give a bit more context, um, Nada added how to make online courses accessible. Um, they said they use Articulate 360. Not sure, and I'm not sure if you're familiar with that platform. So it's an e-learning platform, Articulate and Storyboard. I think there's there's two, three e-learning platforms. So we need to see if the platform itself is having the features of accessibility, which sometimes are when you're creating modules from those platforms, we need to test and see if we can implement accessibility. Sometimes it's not possible because the components come from the platform directly. So we need to work with the platform. Thank you, uh, The other thing I'll, I'll add um, as a presenter that I always try to stay mindful of, and I know that we do this at our events, is if there are visual elements on a slide, say you're presenting learning materials, to try to verbally describe those because that will end up in the transcript um, that a blind person might use later to, uh, uh, you know, consume that material. Thank you. And Amber, did you, were you going to add something? Uh, yeah, I mean, I was just going to say the other resource that might be worth not necessarily using, but referencing some of how they do, uh, the Carroll Center for the Blind, I'll put their link in the chat, it's just carroll.org, uh, but they do training for people who are blind um, on accessibility testing and some other things and maybe looking at what their approach is and their nonprofit organization. They might even like consult with you or that kind of thing to help you figure out how you're cre you can create the most accessible materials for people who are blind. Thank you, everyone. Um, going to the next question, Laura asks, when I do evaluation on my site with WAVE, I get no script element errors on images that I have all text for. Could you please explain if this is something I need to fix and how to fix it? Uh, you it's know, it's funny. I was, I was looking at one of our websites that we have almost ready to launch and I was looking at accessibility checker and I was like, Hey, we're flagging some of these no script <laughs> images too, just like wave. Yeah. Steve, what is that's like a WordPress performance thing or something, right? It, what's what's with the no script images in WordPress and what do we need? Do we need to worry about those or not? Uh, I don't know. I'm stumped on this one a little bit. Uh, so I so, think is in some cases, and I think this happens more when you're using performance plugins, like maybe Perf Matters does this. It like might a, have a second version of the image in a no script tag for like certain an, types of images so that if you have JavaScript off. It's a, yeah, I think it, it's in reference to lazy loading, I think. Yes, what happens is the lazy load images doesn't load and they're deferred until in the performance as Amber is saying. And yeah, yeah. They, mm -hmm. don't, they don't pose any accessibility because while well, the DOM is still there for the screen reader user, if you press uh, in the shortcut key G, he can still access the image in the DOM. Yeah. So, so uh, while while uh, automation uh, throws errors, it's we need to evaluate each one of them and see which one is valid. This is always, I always say, you know, don't just look at the automation results. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think if you do have alt text on it, then it's fine. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and I think I think from our standpoint, like 
I think we were evi- we were getting the issue where we were it was flagging two, right? It was showing both. Like it was showing the no script and the image as duplicates, but yeah, I think it's in reference to lazy loading and and I think it's something that does require a little bit of a human evaluation like Raghavan has said. Thank you. Um, so the next one, it's very specific. Um, David asks, someone mentioned having an H2 heading titled popular products. Underneath each product card, use H3s for product names. However, for SEO purposes, they were advised to change the popular products heading to a div and make the product title titles H2s instead. Is that correct? Lighting round. No. No. <laughs> no. Wrong. I did a big thumbs down <laughs> just in case anyone cannot see me. <laughs> Does anyone want to quickly explain why? <laughs> Poor usability for screen data uses. And... There it is. Yeah. Yes. I mean, you need HTML semantics and they, if you yeah. make that no popular products not a heading, then it won't show up in the headings list and someone can't easily jump to it. Yeah. Uh, and, and so then you, just, someone well, you have a list of uh, just products. random product names with no context, yeah. uh, potentially, right? You don't know that these are prop- popular products because the popular products label is no longer in H2. Yeah. Does it exist on the same page as regular products or unpopular products? <laughs> <laughs> we're all featuring unpopular products. So, Raga, what were you going to say? As someone who practices, yeah, someone who practices SEO, you know, Google reads the heading and reads the following content to get the semantic yeah, relationship this... because uh, this is again in accessibility it's called info and relationship that is what even google follows yeah this yeah, is yeah. one that it's not just bad for accessibility this is a bad seo recommendation yeah i was gonna yes. say uh, Very bad. maybe yeah. the closing remark here is david maybe explore some other seo <laughs> professionals to work with um potentially <laughs> yeah. all right so there's a handful and we only get 15 extra minutes of buffer with our captioner so i'm gonna say um Paula, when you're saying them, why don't you try to pick somebody to respond if you know who it might be best for, and then we're going to try to do fast. Okay, let's do that. Okay, another very specific one. Stephanie asks, I have a webpage with a list of publications from a faculty member. They put the link to the article at the end of the citation. Would it be better to create a hyperlink on the text of the citation as opposed to placing the link at the end? Raga, go for it. Yes, it helps within the... I do it both ways. I put it at, at the end and I put it in the content. Perfect. And you don't want a naked link though, right? Yeah. No, no. Link text should be proper. Okay. Great answer. Um, Next one. Isla asks, Amber and Chris, your very first contact at NASA, what was their job title? If they're thinking of approaching bigger organizations, it's handy to know who can become a cheerleader within the company. Thanks in advance. Okay, so I'll answer this because they contacted me first. Our first contact at, well, for the NASA project was actually JJ, who is, I can't remember his title, but he's like the owner of Ronmar Point, who was a developer who had the contract and they knew they wanted to bring us in. So sometimes on those bigger things, you need to build a relationship with the vendor who is serving the government. But then do you remember, Chris, who the job title was of the person they connected us with after we had multiple convert, but we had multiple conversations with the vendor first. Um, I believe it was Abby, the director of web modernization at NASA. So like a, a large department head. Um, yeah. Yeah, it was, it was Abby was the first person we talked to. Yep. Thanks. Um, the next one, Nada asked, how is gen AI being used in accessible tech? I don't know who, who knows a lot about AI. So whoever wants to take that one. Uh, <laughs> so, so the gen ai like uh, we did have a que- we did we did have a question about this that we didn't get to but uh and i think we could spend a whole meetup on that but um <laughs> uh, we should have one yeah or at least prob- a podcast episode uh, yeah yeah a podcast episode um and to be quite frank i'm not super super versed in it so but as far as ai and accessibility i think there's great things like from a development standpoint AI is super helpful in helping me identify what's wrong. Like I could paste code in or I could use uh, GitHub Copilot to tell me 
why is this not accessible, right? Or like, is this ARIA label or ARIA tag necessary, attribute necessary, right? Things like that. Now, when you get in the generative AI, where the AI is now for the end user to augment their experience, now that's a whole can of worms that uh, that goes very deep. How does the AI actually do that? How does the AI uh, evaluate the spectrum of the disability of the end user? And what if the end user has multiple disabilities? And and at what spectrum is each one of those disabilities? And how do they interact? And how does the AI like? Can AI get there? Maybe to augment the experience to make it uh, a a unique experience for each end user based on their abilities, right? Like it could probably get there. Maybe that's in 10, 20 years. I don't know. Right now, it seems a little like, uh, I don't know. Like, I don't know if it can fully evaluate that end user's abilities. Yeah, AI Thanks. is trained on a ton of inaccessible stuff. So what do you think AI is going to think is the standard mm -hmm. for the web? Right, right. We can't even get AI to generate uh, adequate alt text right now, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, thank you. Next one, Laura asks, well, Laura says, social media icon links, love the equalized accessibility checker. I get a area hidden and link opens a new window or tab warnings connected with my social media links. Please explain what to do. Amber. Okay. Uh, so in general, the best practice for users is not to have any links open in a new tab or window unless they're going to literally break their flow. Like for example, in a form, when you have a privacy policy link in the middle of the form, you of course want that to open in a new tab or window because you don't want them to lose their progress in the form. Other than that, including social media links, they should not open, the best practice is not open new tab and windows because users can choose to do that. Um, if you do have links that open in new tabs and windows, then the second recommendation that's outlined in um, some of the WCAG um, understanding docs is that you would provide a warning. This is also required like for federal section 508 compliance using the US WDS, um, US web design standards in the United States if you're building any organization that wants to follow those. Um, so in our plugin, this is telling you your social media links should not open in a new tab or window. Best thing to do is change them like ours. They just open in the same. People know how to use the back button. They will come back to your website. It's okay. <laughs> but if for some reason you or a client really want them to, you can install. We have a free accessibility uh, new window warnings plugin on wordpress.org. It will automatically add um, ARIA attribute or an ARIA label and a visible icon for sighted people warning them that it opens a new window. And when you have that plugin installed, all of those issues in Accessibility Checker go away. Installed and activated. Thank you. Yeah. And I posted the link to that plugin in the chat as well. Um, next question. Deneb asks Amber for a blog post, how long it's too long? I've been working on a post on multimedia and I generally shoot for about 1200 to 2,500 words, but this one ended up closer to 3,000. Should I pare it down or is it okay? What do you think? Hey, Amber, how long was the WCAG 2.2 summary post you wrote and published over the weekend? Yeah, I said that earlier. So it, it, it was actually 5,883 words. Um, <laughs> to be specific. I don't, I, yeah, <laughs> well, I counted because I wanted to see. Uh, how long is too long really depends on what the goal of the article is, who you're targeting and that kind of stuff. It is, if it is a good piece of content that is appropriately formatted with headings, then um, to like create structure and it makes sense logically for all that content to be together, then it doesn't, you could have a 10,000 word post and it might not be too long. I mean, if from an SEO standpoint or something, I used to read Backlinko a lot. If anyone, and yes. all he did, all he did was create these epic. I mean, some of them were probably twenty thousand word, like huge yes. pages that talked all about this certain aspect of accessibility with like research and links and and stuff. And it was great content. And I would consume like from top to bottom. I would read it all because it solved my I, problem. I, I agree. And I also. <laughs> yeah. So I, I tend to think that there is no such thing as too long, as long as you, it makes sense to keep it together and it's solving the user's problem. Now, 
there might be reasons to say we're going to do a part one and a part two. Um, but I don't know. Like, I don't think anything is too long. Yeah, I 100% agree. And okay, for the next one, we have um, Stephanie. I have a web page with a list of publications from a faculty member. They put the link to the article at the end of the citation. Would it be better to create a hyperlink on the text of the citation as opposed to placing it in the link at the end? Sounds familiar to Oh, wait, I think we did this one. Answered. Yeah, I think we, it may have yeah. doubled. Okay, next one. Just ignore that. Bajarn asks, my clients loves PDF files. When possible, I try to convince them to convert to the content to HTML, but often it's not. Thoughts on that? Speak. Yeah, to convert the content to HTML. But yeah, I mean, yeah, convert it to HTML. Like make an HTML. Yeah, all, web page. Uh, yeah make a web page. Why not? I mean, I think that's the best approach. Amber, do you have a, a difference of opinion? No, yeah. but if a PDF is the way, you, they need to tag them properly because... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they need to yeah, tag the PDFs. I, so there are things where it does make sense that it has to be a PDF. Um, anything that you think someone's going to literally print out, yeah. like, you know, a, a, a brochure that they can print out or you're creating something. I mean, we we did this uh, for a client a long time ago during our agency days, they were, um, an OBGYN and we created like, you know, for women's health month, like a breast self-exam little designed thing with the idea that people would print it out and stick it in their bathroom or something. Right. And it had branding from the client, but like that we're intending that that's a PDF. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so then I think like Raga said, they have to be accessible. They just have to be tagged just the yeah. same way like most of the WCAG guidelines follow it. But if it's yeah. if it if it's valuable content that is not necessarily intended for printout, right? Like mm -hmm. make it a web make it a web page. I mean you're gonna get the you're gonna get the SEO juice off of that and and all the accessibility that comes along with making it semantic HTML. Yeah. Sounds good. Um next one. Stephanie asks, what about underlining for headers? Raga. The headings? Yeah. How do you feel about underlining headings, headers? And I'm guessing that is in the context of links as well, right? Yeah, what we were talking if, about. If possible, avoid uh, links on headings, but I think sometimes it's unavoidable. Yeah, then you need to underline them because I was running as user a link, test. Yeah. But don't it's a link, you underline yeah. your headings for design. Yeah. For design, please do not. Yeah. Okay, the next one. Have you had users feedback that underlying text is hard to read? Users with some form of reading disabilities. Of course, we should make sure we're not underlining a long text or paragraph, but we also want to make links descriptive, so it might not be a word or two. Uh, I'll I'll chime in on this, and then I'll let other people who know more about accessibility follow up. But I think um, <laughs> I, I think that they kind of answered their own question a little bit. I think some of it depends on length, right? Like I, I definitely have trouble reading underlined text if there is not a lot of spacing between the rows of text and it's multiple rows of text underlined, it can really mess with my eyes. Um, so yeah, if you're, if you're, if you have underlined hyperlinks, keep, have it be reasonably descriptive, but also not too long, right? Would there be anything else other people would like to add? I think that's a pretty comprehensive answer. Mm -hmm. um, the next one. Wow, go me. <laughs> <laughs> next one. Can I have your insights on conducting an accessible webinar or Zoom session? In many blind focus sessions, hosts usually ask attendees not to use the chat because the notification is distracting to screen reader users and also hard for them to navigate and listen to the chat while listening to the main session. But chat function is widely used in other disability events. Also because it is a useful feature for those who do not like to speak on the mic, but want to share thoughts. How would you strike the balance for the potential accessibility conflict? Um, I can ask that one to Raga. So uh, I think before any webinars or calls I do, I do prep with my Zoom and Teams because it's always a challenge. So there are a lot of settings, accessibility settings and notification settings. We need to turn them off, turn them on according to the meeting. 
uh, how you want them to alert you. And those settings are in there. Just you know, we need to find. And I think it's it's a learning curve. There's a huge learning curve on these tools on how to navigate both Zoom, Teams, or any other platforms. Yeah, you know, I actually think this is this is an interesting question because we've never we've never asked people not to use the chat. Um, and if we've had a, a speaker who was blind, then um, we've usually during the pre before we go live, wor walk them through how to turn off chat notifications in their Zoom settings if they don't know how, because otherwise it does help. But, but this is an interesting thing that maybe I should think a little bit more about. Like, is that unfair that they don't have access to the same thing and would be better for everyone to not have chat or like do you have any thoughts on that Raga, or do you think it's okay no it's okay so until the notification is not distracting the screen reader because what happens is everything someone joins the room someone has put an emoji icon chat a text the screen reader live region pops up and like you know it's like blah 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 and we don't hear anything else and sometimes I'll, the real problem is not the screen leader speaking or announcing or something. We couldn't, sometimes, you know, we trying to stop it doesn't stop it. It, it keeps on going. Mm -hmm. And that's where do you feel like uh, it's okay there's for an anxiety. to have chat though? I do chat on. Yeah. Right now I read every chat that's coming from the attendees. Yeah. You're just really good at multitasking. <laughs> <laughs> you're listening to the chat and, uh, <laughs> yeah. So the, the, in JAWS, there's a feature where in one year we can listen to the webinar and the other year I'm listening to the JAWS screen reader. Uh -huh. Yeah. I, I will say too, like I, I am never not blown away and impressed when I hear uh, like someone who uses a screen reader all the time, like listen to their screen reader and it's like, blah, 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 blah. that's like, that's what it sounds to me. I can't understand yeah. it at all, but for them it's plain as day. And so I would say too, like, don't doubt people's ability to parse this information um, that's coming in. If that's something that they're very well versed in and very practiced at, right? Yeah, it's definitely a superpower. <laughs> um, going on to the next question, we have a few minutes left, so let's see if we can get through the last three questions. Um, Emily asks, in the blog themes, the logo or site name is an H1. That means if the site name is in the footer, it's also an H1. How would you handle that? My understanding is that there would only be one H1 on your page, which is the page title. Amber. This is a mistake in your blog theme. Yep. Okay. It, it, the, it, it should not be an H1. It arguably might not even be a heading at all. <laughs> the mm -hmm. site title. Yep. That's the answer. Okay. Um, next question. Samara asks, hi, I'm using an icon as a button, but it gives empty link warning. How to fix that in WordPress? Speak. Screen reader text or uh, an ARIA label, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So it depends on how you're creating your button. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This could be a developer level fix. Yeah. Or it could be, um, it could be something that you could just change in the editor, depending on what it is. If you post a link to this in the WordPress accessibility Facebook group, we can help you actually figure out how to fix the specific thing. Yep. Great. And going back to our PDF question earlier, this is a follow-up. So you can have the same information in multiple formats. I think of PDF as a print version too. Um, Amber? Yeah, Lori said that. Yeah, so Lori said that. I think that's fair. Like you could have a web page for something and then also a PDF. So maybe that's the way to handle it with the client that they're like, well, it really needs to have this designed or PDF or whatever. Um, so... Right. Maybe you convince them to have both. Mm -hmm. I yeah. saw there were there were two more that maybe didn't copy over. Um, uh, one about a QR code being the only thing that is presented on printed material. Uh, says this. Uh, Anna says I usually recommend putting both a QR and a short link. Do we think it's helpful to have a QR and a short link? I think so. Yeah, I think so too. Uh, and then 
Sue recently read an article saying that links should, oh, this is about um, links not opening in new windows or tabs. So we might've addressed this already. Let me look. Um, the compelling, so she's asked, does anyone have a compelling reason not to do this other than the WCAG recommendation? I mean, the reason why is that, why you have to warn people is when you open a new window or tab, the back button doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And the normal expectation is when I follow a link, if I want to go back where I was before, I can use my back button. <laughs> but that doesn't function when it's in a new tab because there's no history in that tab. So the way you get back is different. You'd have to close the tab. And so the idea behind the warning is it tells someone how they can get back mm -hmm. without them having to explore and figure it out. Yeah. And like I think you mentioned that uh, opening links in a new tab is something a user can can choose to do. Like, uh, you know, I know on a on a Mac, you can just hit, hold down the command key and click and it opens in a new window. And I think you can even set your browser settings to open all, all links in new windows. So it's something a user can, can define. So why, why override that? Right. Yeah. I am actually going back through a lot of our older content where we were like opening things in new windows. And even though we have the warning and I am removing it as I update those pieces of content. So, yeah, I think it goes back to like, you know, the thing I like about accessibility when it comes to development and stuff is that it does create some standards, right? It's not something we have to think about anymore, right? Like, it's not like, well, this client wants to open in a new link, right? It's just like, no, we just don't do that. It's not our standard. And and it, and the same with, you know, underlining link text, like we spoke about earlier. It's like, no, it's just not something we do. We have a standard. And that makes projects go a lot quicker. Mm -hmm. So... We are definitely over time. Uh, our captioning is going to stop in two minutes, so I think we should wrap up. Um, but this has been great. We'll have a recap with all of those links that were shared in the chat um, in a couple of weeks. Uh, if you have any additional questions, you can always get a hold of us on the equalizedvisual.com website. Um, we also recommend checking out if you're not in the meetup group or you can go to our events calendar either way and you can register for other upcoming events and join the Facebook group and you can post additional questions there as well. So thanks everybody. Thank you everyone. Bye. Thanks everyone. Bye. See you.